everybody. This is Matt. I'm the lead pastor of Westminster Baptist Church. Thanks for engaging God's word with us. My prayer for you is that this would be supplemental to your discipleship journey. Uh, if we can connect you with a local church or a discipleship group, uh, please contact us at info at discoverwbc.com. Well, last week we looked at how God uses us to restore others. Uh, talking about how we are always in this process of being restored and restoring others. And today I want you to see what, God, what happens after God restores people, this calling to go and what God is calling us to do within that calling. Because we are asking the question, what, what would Jesus do in this world? And I think most people, when they ask that question, they're not necessarily asking um, about how uh, Jesus would call us in spiritual disciplines to follow after the Father, or necessarily how uh, Jesus would... Um, um, be coming back or apocalyptic thoughts or anything of that nature. But I think what they are essentially asking is when we face difficult situations uh, on earth, when we have to face uh, um, the realities of what, what this world can bring to us and the difficult relationships that we see and the temptations that we face, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus actually do in those scenarios? And so I, wa- I wanted you to think with me about this, this time where Jesus was with his disciples in the last moments of him being physically on this earth, God in the flesh, uh, before he sends his spirit to be present in our lives uh, for the rest of eternity, working in and through us to accomplish his mission. When Jesus is headed towards heaven, what does Jesus do with his disciples? So think through it. He has been raised from the dead, been declared to be the powerful son of God through uh, David and the lifting up of the Holy Spirit uh, to raise him up from death into life. Jesus is before his disciples and he says, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me and therefore go and make disciples. Can you imagine if all the disciples like in that moment heard that and were like, but Jesus, I'm afraid. But Jesus, uh, I want to go back to what I was doing. Uh, I want to go spend time with my family. I don't want to do those things. Uh, I am, I, I'm, I, I've been denying you, doubting you. Uh, I can't go do what you've called me to do. Imagine in front of the resurrected king, that would be our response. But so many times, so often in our days and lives, uh, that is our response to Christ. I want you to imagine another scenario when Jesus was uh, feeding the 5,000 or 4,000 or uh, the many times throughout the gospel where Jesus is providing for people. I want you to imagine Jesus walking over to his disciples. He's like, hey, Peter, James, John, uh, and the rest of you. Uh, I want you to go out in the crowd and I want you to walk one by one. I want you to talk to everybody and I want you to make sure that none of them are sinners and none of them are sick. Like if there's any... If there's anybody who's a leper out there, if anybody's got any sort of skin disease or lesions or they're sick in any way, like get them out. We're only going to provide food for those who are in the crowd who are without sin and who are without sickness. You see, that's essentially what this series has been all about. God has chosen to redeem and use those who are far from him. God has chosen to use sinners to preach the greatest message of all time, the gospel message of Jesus Christ. So in this series, I essentially sought to answer the question biblically, looking at biblical theology and text to ask the question, what did Jesus do? And the answer continually became uh, that he would rescue sinners, he would save sinners, he would transform sinners into his children, and he would send his children to, to save sinners. So today I want you to look with me at what Jesus would do at the end of his ministry physically on earth. And I hope that as we walk away, we will all know that Jesus restores and replicates disciples. In John chapter 20, and we're going to begin at verse 11. It says, But Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she was crying, she stooped to look into the tomb. She saw two, disciples, uh, two angels in white sitting where Jesus' body had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you crying? Because they've taken away my Lord, she told them, and I don't know where they've put him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know it was Jesus. Woman, Jesus said to her, Why are you crying? Who is it that you're seeking? Supposing he was the gardener, she replied, Sir, If you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. Turning around, she said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Don't cling to me, Jesus told her, since I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and tell them that I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. 
Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them what, she, what he had said to her. When it was evening on that first day of the week, the disciples were gathered together with the doors locked because they feared the Jews. Jesus came, stood among them, and said to them, Peace be with you. Having said this, he showed them his hands and his side, so the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. After saying this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, called twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So that other disciples were telling him, We've seen the Lord. But he said to them, If I don't see the mark of the nails in his hand, put my finger into the mark of the nails, and and put my hand into his side, I will never believe. A week later, his disciples were indoors again, and Thomas was with them. Even though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you for a third time. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and look at my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Don't be faithless, but believe. Thomas responded to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. He revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called twin, Nathaniel from Cana of Galilee, Zebedee's sons, and two others, uh, others of his disciples were together. I'm going fishing, Simon Peter said to them. I love that statement. It's my favorite parts. Y'all were waiting for that, weren't you? We're coming with you, they told him. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. That's also my story. Uh, Anyways, verse 4. When daybreak came, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Friends, Jesus called to them, you don't have any fish, do you? No, they answered. Cast the net on the right side of the boat, he told them, and you'll find some. So they did, and they were unable to haul it in because of the large number of fish. The disciple, the one Jesus loved, said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he tied his outer clothing around him, for he had taken it off and plunged into the sea. Since they were not far from land, about a hundred yards away, the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish lying on it and bread. Bring some of the fish you've caught, Jesus told them. So Simon Peter climbed up and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. Even though there were so many, the net was not torn. Come and have breakfast, Jesus told them. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them. He did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. And when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said to him. You know that I love you. Feed my lambs, he told them. A second time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, he said to him. You know that I love you. Shepherd my sheep, he told him. He asked him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved that he asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep, Jesus said. Truly I tell you, when you were younger, you would tie your belt, walk wherever you wanted, but when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will tie you and carry you where you don't want to go. He said this to indicate by what kind of death Peter would glorify God. After saying this, he told him, follow me. You see, when Jesus was with his disciples, and he called them with all authority, having been resurrected, the Spirit of God clearly on him, every miracle being performed that they had seen, when he says to them, go and make disciples, the reality is he had been telling them that throughout their ministry, but right now in this moment we find Mary crying at the tomb, doubting at Jesus. We find the disciples in a room fearing the Jews. We find Peter uh, had denied Jesus three times, and we find Thomas doubted Jesus. You see, I began this sermon asking you the question, what would we do and why do we respond to Jesus in that way? Well, we see four different individuals or groups of people who responded the same way we do every single day. 
And I think we have to see this. Like we have to see this moment where the disciples are doing what we often do. Because many of us may be sitting in this room and there's times in your life where you weren't making disciples, where, where you weren't going or being sent and you felt like guilt or you felt like, God, I'm, I, I want to do what you want me to do, but I don't know how to do it. Or somebody in here maybe in this room was like, I, I, don't, I doubt God. I've been denying God publicly. I'm struggling with who he is or I'm wrestling with his temptation and sin and I don't feel like God can send me. That's where we find find Mary. That's where we find Thomas. That's where we find Peter. That's where we find all of the disciples. So when we ask the question, what would Jesus do at the end of his ministry, the last moments of him physically being on earth before he sends the Holy Spirit into their lives, what would Jesus do? He'd call them to go and make disciples. So what about Mary? Mary? You see, uh, John is very um, intentional with his words in his gospel. Um, he'll, he'll use them throughout his gospel to really draw us into the meaning of a verse. And see, since Jesus began his ministry, which we uh, know, like in chapter 12, he shifts to go into, into Jerusalem. Since Jesus began the ministry of, of heading towards Jerusalem for his crucifixion and resurrection moment, he's been using this word peruamai. And every time he uses it, six times in total, he, he, what he's saying is, I am going to be with the Father. Jesus says, I'm going to be with the Father. I'm going to be with the Father consistently throughout uh, uh, the Gospel of John. Maybe the climax would be in John 16, 28, the last time he uses it in this scenario. He says, I came from the Father and have come into the world. And again, I am leaving the world and going to the Father. Think about the impact that has for the disciples who were thinking that Jesus was going to ascend to a throne and overrule Rome and uh, lead Israel to be the nation that all people would look to and turn towards. And Jesus says, I'm going to the Father. And they're like, what? You're not leaving us. Don't leave us here. And he's like, it's necessary that I leave you so that I can give you the Holy Spirit. So he says, I'm going to the Father. Now think about it. John 16, 28. It's the last time he said he was, they, that G, the Gospel of John uses the word go, or peru am I in Greek. Last time. The next time it's used is in John chapter 20, verse 17. When Jesus, after Mary finds out that it's, his, it's her Savior, and she's clinging to Jesus, Jesus says, don't cling to me, since I'm not yet a sin to the Father, but go. First time it's used since John chapter 16, because there's meaning in words. As I'm going to the Father, Mary, you go to your brothers. There's so much meaning and richness here in this moment, but think about Mary. Think about where she was. She's weeping at the tomb. She thinks that Jesus is gone forever. Uh, She doesn't see that he's been resurrected. She sees the linen in there, and she's still kind of having these doubts. All of a sudden, angels, Jesus is appearing. She, uh, She sees Jesus, and she thinks he's a gardener. She doesn't even recognize him, and it's not until the moment that that he recognizes her that she recognizes him. So we, we often, man, we often put Thomas down, like doubting Thomas. But throughout this, all four groups of people are struggling with seeing and knowing and believing Jesus. I do think it's fascinating that Mary is the one uh, that Jesus comes to and says, go preach this to my brothers. I mean, she literally runs to them and says, like, I've seen the Lord. The, f- the first person to preach the gospel running to it is Mary Magdalene. The one whom was the sinner that the Pharisees and Sadducees rejected. The one who was a a woman who wouldn't be in in their time, wouldn't have been even able to preach or speak truth about the Old Testament or New Testament alike. God works through her and uses her. Look, if you are in a space right now where you feel like you have been mourning at the cross over sin, over struggle, you feel like Jesus has been far from you, you feel like you have no purpose, and just like Mary laying at the feet of the tomb, that's where Jesus comes. That's where Jesus finds Mary. Not Mary preaching, not Mary celebrating, not Mary confident, not Mary in full faith, not Mary recognizing Jesus, Mary doubting, thinking that it's a gardener. And I think we need to hear this. We need to know this, that it's in those moments that Jesus says, go, go. Another word that makes a difference in the New Testament, it's a Greek word, pimpo. It means to send out, something like that. It's used 27 times throughout the Gospel of John. And this time it's where Jesus finds the disciples. The disciples are afraid. They're inside of a room. Think about it. All right, y'all, think about this with me. Jesus, the Son of God, walks on water, calls Peter to walk on water, calms the sea. 
heals people who were paralyzed, gives people sight who were blind. That Jesus told them, wait, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And what do they do? They go into a room afraid of the Jews. Why were they afraid? Because they were afraid that the Jews would do the same thing to them that they did to Jesus. 27 times the word to send, pimpo, is used throughout the Gospel of John. And every single time, or uh, 25 times out of 27, it's used to say Jesus is sending the Holy Spirit into our hearts. At 25 times, the, Jesus is sending the Holy Spirit in our hearts. Jesus is sending the Holy Spirit in our hearts. And finally, in John chapter 20, verse 21, Jesus is talking to the group who doesn't recognize him. Again, remember, Thomas, the one we call Doubting Thomas, all the disciples are afraid inside of a room. Jesus comes in. They don't even recognize him. It's not until he goes, look, whole, side, that they go, that's the Lord. And we, we, we struggle with Thomas. Guys, we are all in this boat. It's where Jesus finds all of us. We can't look at Mary as like this, uh, as the perfect role model or the disciples as the perfect role model or Thomas or Peter or any of them. Rather, we see them as the sinners and the sick who they are, just like Jesus always comes for because Jesus rescues sinners. In John chapter 20, verse 21, Jesus said to them again, and here it is, y'all, 25 out of 27 times is talking about the Holy Spirit being sent in our hearts. Jesus says, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, not even the same word, guys, it's apostolo. He doesn't even use it right there. He reserves it with all the power of him saying, I'm sending the Holy Spirit into your lives. He says, I also send you. Think about the weight that they would feel in those moments. Mary hearing for the first time since Jesus was talking about it as he's going to the Father, he then says, now your role is to go to the brothers. The disciples hearing for the first time this phrase sent, not being used as the Holy Spirit being sent to their hearts, but now he's Jesus is like, yeah, I'm sending the Holy Spirit in your hearts and I'm sending you to the people. I think John wants us, to, wants us to see the significance of Jesus replicating, sending, and going by using these specific words. And we've got to make sure we zoom in on these things because it's not because of where they were and who they were. It's because of who Jesus is that he comes to them and says, go and be sent. The next guy we see is Thomas, right? And he's the one we talk about so much uh, as being the one who is the doubting Thomas. And I want you to see the words that are used here, right? So the two words, to know and to believe. Arao in Greek and pastuo. Arao means to know. Pastuo means to believe. All right? Just walk with me through this. When they're used together, uh, Jesus uses them every single time throughout the Gospel of John as uh, you want to see things. You want to know things in order to believe. In fact, it's used in John chapter 1 verse 50, verse 4, uh, sorry, chapter 4, verse 48, chapter 6, verse 30, chapter 6, verse 36, and here in John 20, in the same exact way. You want to see so that you can believe. The only time it's flipped, Orao and Pastuo, is in John chapter 11, verse 40, where it says, Jesus said to her, didn't I tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? But Thomas in John chapter 20 says, We've seen the Lord, uh, the disciples say to him, we've seen the Lord. And he says, if I don't see the mark of the nails in his hand and put my finger into the mark of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will never believe. If I don't see or know or rao, I will never pastuo. I'll never believe. And so Jesus says in verse 29, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. And right there, like we're all like, oh yeah, Thomas, man, you should have totally believed without having to see. Mary had to see. The disciples had to see. They were afraid in a room. Thomas, after a week, we don't even know where Thomas was, right? In some moments, I'm like, guys, all you disciples were in that room. Mary's out there in the thick of it. Where were y'all? And then I'm like, what was Thomas doing? I guess he was hiding like fishing. I don't know. I don't know, but here's what I do know. When he comes back and the disciples say, we saw the Lord, he's like, no, I didn't. I have to see him. And so we kind of get, we're kind of hard on Thomas, but, but do you see what this is saying for us? Verse 29, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. And the next verse says, uh, the next passage says this, I've written these things to you so that you may 
believe. Right? What John is trying to show us is that we, we as uh, disciples thousands of years later aren't seeing physically Jesus. In human form, walking with us, we don't physically see him. But Peter, Mary, James, John, Thomas, all of them got to see him physically. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. And it's like John speaking to the church and the next generations to say, you may never see physically Jesus on earth on, in your lifetime. But blessed are those who haven't seen and still believe. We need that reassurance because there's times where, and I mean, I, let me tell you something. I, I don't know if you feel this way, but like I feel like Mary and the disciples and Thomas sometimes, I feel like I'm in these seasons where I'm like, God, I just want to see you. Or maybe you're in a season where you're like being tempted and you're like, God, I just need to feel your power. Or maybe you're in a worry season, anxiety season. And you're like, God, I just need you to calm me down. And we're all these different seasons. And sometimes, I don't know about you, but it feels like, man, should I really ask God to be present in this moment? Like, is it wrong for me to say, God, I'm doubting. I need to see you. Like, I need to hear from you. I need your word to be truth for me. God, I'm, I'm wrestling with this. And you look back at Mary, and it's like, what if Jesus would have showed up to Mary and been like, dude, you don't even know who I am? You think I'm a gardener? And just walked away from her like, I can't use you. And I think sometimes as, as believers in the 21st century, we feel like if we don't have all our act together and have everything figured out and understand the Bible good enough and, and, and see Jesus working in certain places and go to do it, like he's not going to use us. That's crazy. Look at what he does with Mary and the disciples and Thomas. And I think it's beautiful. I don't think, man, we should reject this. You look at what Jesus did with Thomas, and it's like Jesus met Thomas exactly where he needed him. Jesus met Thomas in Thomas' greatest need. The disciples in their greatest fear and Mary in her greatest weeping. That's where Jesus met them. And Peter. I want you to back up a second with me, uh, with Peter. John chapter 13, verses 36 through 38. Lord, Simon Peter said to him, Where are you going? Jesus answered, Where I am going, you cannot follow me now but you will follow later. Lord, Peter asked, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus replied, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, I tell you, a rooster will not crow until you have denied me three times. Here's the scenario. Jesus is headed to Jerusalem to die on a cross. Peter says, I'll follow you to that cross. Jesus says, no, you're not. You're going to deny me three times. John chapter 18. Then the servant girl, who was the doorkeeper, said to Peter, you aren't one of this man's disciples too, are you? I am not, he said. First denial. Second, verse 25. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They said to him, you aren't one of his disciples too, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. Here's the third one, verse 26. One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose uh, ear Peter had cut off, said, didn't I see you with him in the garden? Peter denied it again. That's the third time. You see, Peter denied him three times. And it's, and it's in that context that we all of a sudden read through John 21, and it makes sense why Peter is uh, uh, working with Jesus and kind of uh, experiencing this breakfast with Jesus. And Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? He says, yes, of course. Right? Second time, Peter, do you love me? Yes. Third time, Peter, do you love me? And it clicks for Peter. Peter, who denied Jesus three times publicly, is now restored by Christ, forgiven. And he says to him, feed my sheep, shepherd my sheep. Restores him back to the pastor he was called to be. And for Peter, the one who, when he got out of the boat, was walking on the water and Jesus was walking towards him and he struggled with his faith and he sunk into the water. Remember, Peter is the one who saw his Savior on the shore and jumped out of the water and swam to his Savior. Man, some of us, and some in the church, man, you sometimes you feel so like, you're struggling with if, if you're worth anything. You're struggling with if you're too caught up in sin. You're struggling with if you're too far from Jesus, too much doubt, too much denial. And Jesus just restores. It doesn't just restore him. Did you, did you see what he did at the end of it? The last, the last two things Jesus does with Peter in this, in this passage, he says, 
When you were a kid, you were able to do whatever you wanted to do. But when you're going to get older, they're going to tie you up and throw you on a cross too. And so what's his last phrase to him? Follow me. In John, on John chapter 13, Peter says, I'll follow you and I'll die for you. And Jesus says, no, you're going to deny me. In John chapter 21, after being denied and rejected and rebuked by Peter, Jesus restores him to be a pastor yet again. Because Jesus restores people and sends them. So what would Jesus do with you? If he would restore Mary and Thomas, the disciples, and Peter, what would he do with you? Every single one of us has a different role. He sent Mary to the disciples. He sent the disciples to forgive sins. He sent Peter to shepherd the church. We assume Thomas was lumped into the disciples to go preach the gospel. Everyone in the church is being restored and has a different role. But the key there is everyone has a role. Each one of us has a role in the plan of God because God on earth, Jesus in the flesh, when you ask him, what would Jesus do? And what did Jesus do? The answer is he'd rescue sinners, turn them into children, and send them out to uh, rescue sinners too. Jesus rescues sinners, transforms them into his children, and sends them to rescue other sinners. So no matter where you are today, the question is, what would God do with you? And the answer is, He'd redeem you. He'd reconcile you. He'd restore you. And he'd replicate you. Because redeemed people redeem others. Reconciled people reconcile others. Restored people restore others. And people who have been restored replicate themselves. So I want to challenge you this morning like Mary and Peter and Thomas and the disciples. I want, you to, I want to challenge you to think like Jesus would when you engage the world. Would you look at how Jesus engaged the sick, the sinners, and the saints? Remembering at the beginning of the series where we saw Jesus never once rebuked a sick or a sinner, a person who was sick or a sinner. Fascinating. Not once did he engage individually with a, with a person who was sick or a sinner and rebuke them. Consistently, when he met with perceived saints, people who thought they were good but were actually struggling, he continued to rebuke them. In fact, it wasn't until perceived saints recognized their sins that they experienced the same grace and mercy that the sick and sinners did. You see, because when Jesus walks over to Peter, James, and John, and he's about to feed the 5,000, he doesn't tell them to go find the ones who are perfect and feed them only. He says, go. He, essentially what he does is looks at the whole crowd full of sinners and full of sick, and he says, provide food for them, for they are hungry. So start with how God engages through Jesus Christ, his son, the sick sinners and the saints. Ask what he would do internally with those who follow after him and those who don't. And then finally finish with what he would do with them externally. What is God using you to do and what is God working through other people to do? That is how we act like Christ. That is how we respond to what would Jesus do? He'd rescue sinners. He would transform their lives, freeing them and forgiving them of sin. And then he would send them to replicate themselves. So go, church. Take the gospel to those who are far from Jesus. Help them find transformation in their lives and send them to do the same that Christ has called you to do. And so my question for you this morning is this, where are you? Maybe you are like Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus, waiting for his every word, longing for his presence, but struggling to even identify where he is. And he comes to you and it says, don't cling to me. Do you understand how, like what that would feel like for Mary? She's weeping at the tomb. Jesus comes to her and she clings to him and he says, go. Because she has a mission. He's given her a role. And each one of us in this room have a responsibility, a calling, a role in the church to be a light in the midst of darkness, to proclaim the gospel to those who are far from Christ. Maybe this morning you're like the disciples. You're afraid in a room and you feel like Jesus is gone. You fear life without him and you struggle to understand what your purpose is even though he's been with you and you feel like you know his word. You feel like you've been raised in church. You feel like you have this like understanding of what he calls people to do and you've been trying to do it but you've been through a season where you're like, I don't know where God is. He's been distant from me and then all of a sudden he shows up and he restores your faith and he sends you. Where are you? Are you like Thomas? Thomas? struggling to believe, and you're like pleading with God, show me. God, 
I need to see you. God, I need to hear you. Would you work in my life? I'm struggling to believe. Would you perform a miracle? Restore my faith? And he sends you. Maybe you're like Peter and you've denied Jesus publicly. Maybe you've fallen into sin. Maybe you've been walking away from Christ. Maybe you're still doing it today. Maybe the temptation feels like it's too much. And maybe you've given up, but you're still sitting in church. That's where Jesus finds us. And he forgives us and he frees us. And that's where he restores us. And that's where he sends us. God is not finished with you. You know, I... I think about this. For the church today in modern day America, when we ask the question, what would Jesus do? Remember this truth. Jesus is not leaving his followers alone. Not afraid, not disgraced, and not a failed group of world changers. God's not finished with the church. He may be finished with every nation in the world. He may be finished with the USA, but he's not finished with the church. He's not finished with the church. Just as his disciples in a room and as Peter is denying him and Mary's at the tomb and Thomas is who knows where, he's not finished with the church. So church, remember, redeemed people redeem, reconciled people reconcile, restored people restore. So go and replicate. As the band comes, I want to give you three gospel responses this morning. First, identify what you need. What do you need this morning? Do you need direction like Mary? Do you need reassurance like the disciples? Do you need restoration like Peter? Identify who you need. Did you you see that the only common thread throughout these four individuals and groups, like Mary, the disciples, Thomas, and Peter, do you know what the only common thread throughout four of them being restored is? Jesus' presence. That's the only thing that's consistent. Jesus comes to them and physically shows himself to them and it changes their life and direction forever. So identify who do you need for clarity on what God has called you to do. Run to Jesus and Jesus finds us even when we're not coming to him in the midst of our deepest, darkest, most crying, most rejecting, most denying moments, Jesus finds us. And then finally, identify where you are going. Man, it's awesome. Mary went to the disciples. That was her role. Right? The disciples went to forgive. That was their role. We, we know Matthew went to Africa. Uh, Thomas ended up in India. Uh, Peter goes to Rome. The disciples were scattered. But where is God calling you? You know, we get told this a lot, Pastor Glenn, right? God is not calling me to Haiti. Okay, but where is God calling you to? So I'll close with the same challenge that, uh, that I began with. If Jesus was with us today, which I believe he is present and speaking through his word, and called us to go and make disciples, would you be afraid? Would you deny him? Would you doubt him? Would you feel like you're alone? And if so, the disciples did too. And that's where Jesus found them. And that's where Jesus restored them. So if you feel like you're alone, broken, doubting, This is where Jesus finds you. Let him restore you. Let me pray for you. God, you are good. Your word is true. I pray you would use it, Father, to grow us, change us, convict us of what we haven't done, convict us of what we should have done, and compel us to go do what you have for us, God. We are your people. You are our God. Use us to be sent in the midst of darkness to light it up. Help us to preach your name your son's salvation in the streets and on the mountaintops, in the darkness, in the light. Help us to preach your message to this world who is lost and broken. And Father, would we do what your son did? Would we follow after him no matter where that leads us to? We love you, Father. We praise you in your son's name. Amen. speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind cause I know there is peace within your presence 
I speak Jesus I just want to speak the name of Jesus So every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadow. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over fear and all anxiety to every soul held captive by depression. I speak. Jesus, cause your name is power, your name is healing, your name is life, yes it is, break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. Shout Jesus from the mountains and Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus Put a powerful 
Shout Jesus one more time. Shout Jesus from the mountains. Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the dark. Jesus for my family. I speak the holy name. Jesus. Oh, King Jesus. Amen, church. So, amen, redeemed church. Remember, you're sent in the midst of darkness to light up. Let me challenge you next week to be here. I want you to make it a purpose to be here because you are going to see the baptism of a, of a young lady that is going to be powerful and exciting. I can't tell you, this has been one of the, probably the, my favorite series I've ever preached. It, for me personally, it's been so transformative. I, you know, I hope that it's been transformative in your life. But next week, you're going to see a testimony from somebody that God has directly impacted and changed their life. Please come next week and get to see what God is doing. And if you've never been baptized or if you've never believed in Jesus, we'd love to talk to you as well. All right, church, go light it up. You have any questions about the sermon or would like to know more about following after Jesus, uh, please contact us and we would love to talk more about your relationship with Christ and how you can grow in your spiritual journey.